Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, for those of you, I think I recognize everyone on the screen, at least. I'm Kevin Haggerty. I'm a professor here at the University of Alberta. And this is, I think, the first talk of the uh, Center for Criminological Research fall term. And we are very, very pleased to have Dr. Lois Presser, who's joining us from Tennessee, correct? So Dr. Presser is a uh, uh, Dr. Presser is a professor in the Department of Sociology <laughs> at the University of Tennessee. Uh, she has a long list of contributions that I encourage you to take a look at. Um, suffice to say that she is one of the leading figures in what we call the recent narrative turn in criminology. We've had several narrative turns, um, and her work fits broadly within the field of cultural sociology, critical criminology, uh, discourse analysis, some kind of recent highlights at least, and include her book, uh, Inside Story, How Narratives Drive Mass Harm. Uh, she also co-authored the collection on, just called Narrative Criminology, I think, with Professor Sandberg. Some of you might remember that Professor Sandberg was with us here in Edmonton the day that the pandemic became a global international pandemic, specific exactly that day. So uh, they worked closely together. And uh, she has right now a book forthcoming, and I think it is called, what is the Unsaid, Analyzing Harmful Silences. And Dr. Presser and I are currently working on an edited uh, Oxford University Press collection on, uh, what are we calling it? Critical and Cultural Theories in Criminology. And today we are privileged to have her talking about, uh, the talk is Narratives, Crime and Harm. So we have a Zoom uh, interaction. We also have, some of you are on YouTube. We, I think Dr. Presser is going to be talking for about a half hour. If you have questions as things go along, please post them in the chat, either uh, on the Zoom or on YouTube. Uh, that I will be, I will have access to both, and I'll sort of take responsibility for asking questions at the end. But don't, please don't wait till the end. If you do have a question, it's best to get in the queue so we can uh, move quickly when the time comes. So. Uh, I will disappear, uh, but Lois, thank, I'm here, but I'm invisible. Thanks, Lois. I look forward to this. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate being with you, albeit virtually, and uh, being part of the series. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, this is going to work. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so Kevin already gave you the title of the talk. I'm going to take on two tasks. The first is to um, answer this question, what is narrative criminology? The second is to pry open the main premise of this paradigm, narrative criminology. Um, and the main premise is that stories do something in regard to crime and other harm. So that's to put on my positivist hat, that's sort of the mechanism question. How's that supposed to work, that stories influence um, harm? Just a, a quick note on terms, and I can circle back to these decisions later, um, but I'm going to use narrative and story interchangeably even though there's some really interesting things to say about how people use them differently. And I'm also gonna kind of gloss, of gloss the difference between crime and harm and mostly talk in terms of harm, which those of us who um, call ourselves critical criminologists will recognize uh, uh, that gesture. Um, and again, this is something we can talk about later. So um, uh, Kevin mentioned uh, Professor Sandberg, Svein and Sandberg from the University of Oslo, and I know that he had visited there and had a really um, great time with the people at Alberta. We have, uh, in 2015, we published this volume called Narrative Criminology, and we set out a definition. It's any inquiry based on the view of stories as instigating, sustaining, or effecting desistance from harmful action. That volume followed 
my own 2009 paper that in which I coined the expression narrative criminology. And this second definition has a bit more <clears throat> heat. Is a little more, more negative because it um, it says that narrative criminology positions the narrative itself as opposed simply to the events reported in the narrative. Um, you guys are 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 um, are the the thing the the Hollywood Squares thing is over my uh, text as a factor in the motivation for an accomplishment of crime and criminalization. So I want to pick up on that negativity. Um, criminology has long used stories and long celebrated stories, but for what they report, for what they are about or what um, you could call propositional content. So we have Clifford Shaw, his um, classic book, The Jack Roller or Jack Roller, I forget, but from 1930, uh, according to um, James Bennett, um, illuminated uh, or he used a delinquent's own story, that's the subtitle of, of Shaw's book, to illuminate the process of transmission of delinquent practices from one person or group to another and the gradual evolution of those practices through further participation in delinquent groups. So collect the story, the life story in this case of, of one kid, and you'll find uh, that, you know, I started hanging out with Petey and then I started to shoplift. And so you'll find out the the composite events of um of the, of one's life of the kid's life samson and lao prominent contemporary criminologists have um tipped a hat to narrative data um, because they along with qualitative data more generally can quote help uncover underlying social processes of stability and change so if you're familiar with their um, their work, which is positioned within life course criminology. Oh, uh, you know, in 1938, I, I got married and then I kind of stepped off of my gambling or what have you. So again, it's the, it's the events, it's the experiences that we can, we can pull out of a narrative. We're not particularly interested in narratives themselves. Whoops. And then finally, more recently and quite interesting, um, Bob Agnew, um, who's um, uh, done a, an array of important work in criminology. Um, in maybe his least cited work uh, or, or venture, he coined the concept of storylines. So I took interest um, at that time and he contrasted. So storylines for, for Agnew are the events and conditions leading up to a crime. And the analyst should, again, once again, excise these or pull them out of whatever offenders have to say, because in fact, offenders accounts, and here I'll start this quote, present a selective and often distorted portrayal of the stuff of interest. So this is kind of where we have been with some interesting exceptions. I actually don't have a slide for this, but um, I'm really interested in how critical criminologists have long um, uh, highlighted uh, stories, you know, big discourses that construct moral panics or that construct binaries between good people and bad people, not using so many narrative terms or the vocabulary of narratology, but there, there's other um, uh, other stuff that kind of gets to what narrative criminology does, which is that stories have a constitutive relationship with action and, and uh, social arrangements. Um, stories impact us, whatever their truth. Sort of what's lurking, especially explicated in, in Bob Agnew's, um, the quote that I pulled from Agnew's article, is that uh, we can't really trust offender stories because they're probably not true and they're probably not true you know we can we can be sociologists about this because of the incentives for manipulating you know my rap sheet my criminal history etc uh, my culpability um but we know that stories impact us whatever their truth beyond our discipline very many case studies bear this out and i have um four examples to to show you um, they happen to mostly be about mass harm. So we sort of start to get away from 
conventional criminology in doing in in, in um, picking up a narrative criminological lens. So this person studied literature of activists who would um, bomb abortion clinics in the United States and did a very close narrative analysis of those um, that literature and, and uh, reports narrating the new abortion warrior as besieged, outnumbered, and victimized. Pro-life writing makes the white Christian heterosexual male a hero above all others. So again, what can what what can um, truth matter here? Does you know if we what, what can we make of well that's not real that guy's not really a hero you know it, it, it obviously um, doesn't have too much relevance. From war, I am a great fan of Philip Smith, who's a cultural sociologist, and um, his 2005 book, Why War, sets out um, a, a, another close analysis. But this time, he's interested in um, comparing genres that um, lead to war in the face of international conflict or lead to diplomacy or just something fizzles out. And we are, um, you know, all knee deep in news about uh, the war going on in Ukraine. Uh, Smith writes, apocalyptic narratives, that's the genre um, he's highlighting, are the most effective at generating and legitimating massive society-wide sacrifice and are today the only narrative form that can sustain war as culturally acceptable. And for more on the... um, the characteristics of apocalyptic narratives, uh, which Mason also talks about apocalyptic narratives. I'm not, for some reason, not pronouncing that correctly. Um, uh, you'll you'll want to get that book. In the United States, we have the death penalty in a number of, of, um, of states. And Judith Kay is a philosopher, also a friend of mine, who uh, published a book that same year, 2005, called Murdering Myths. Um, The story of the death penalty depicts good violence as rejuvenating the ties that bind the community against peoples or forces deemed evil. Finally, and perhaps my favorite example um, is meat eating, which gets us even further away from from what we know is criminology, but it's um, an example I think about a lot because I can be rather reflexive with it because I eat meat. And uh, Foyer is, you may know that um, name. He's a novelist uh, based in Brooklyn. Uh, He wrote a book called Eating Meat, one of his only nonfiction books. And he says, when I graduated from college, I ate meat, lots of every kind of meat for about two years. Why? Because it tasted good. And because more important than reason in shaping habits are the stories we tell ourselves and one another. And I told a forgiving story about myself to myself. And with the foyer example, with the mediating example, we dip into um, a mass harm, a quite institutionally supported harm that is nonetheless deeply personal. And he's talking about self stories, which is rather interesting. So what's new about narrative criminology foremost is that it um, posits the narrative itself as influencing harm, harmful arrangements and harmful actions. Um, it does, when I say narrative itself, and that can really probably use some unpacking, but I'll breeze through it right now. Um, what we're talking about is attention, not so much to, you know, what gets said, but to how it gets said. Plot line, characters, genres, and so forth. Um, this is a very short list, and Svein and Sandberg would um, want to talk in terms of the storytelling interaction, um, but I'm making little of that. Um, and furthermore, narrative criminology pays pays particular attention to narrative and not other discursive forms. So whereas, um, so so not ideology, but narrative or narrated ideology, not discourse, which is a great term. Um, but narrative discourse, not propaganda, but narrative propaganda or narrated propaganda. 
um, I'm going to take this cough drop. And here's a picture of a lion and a mouse. Tells a story. So this might remind Kevin of the morning session on visual chronology or not. Here's a story. Here's a picture of me as a toddler. Uh, what is a story anyway? So, so if you're so so for for novices to to narrative anything, you know that we're we're sort of used to just narrative narr a narrative of neoliberalism, a narrative of whatever. And um, I'm one of those who wants to police, you know conversation about like well, well narrative actually means a particular thing there there are different conceptualizations but there's there's a great deal of agreement on a narrative as connecting or relating events and experiences i i woke up i got ready for work and then my car didn't start etc one thing another thing um I want to say that if I told you I woke up, here's the story, I woke up, you would say, you would either say that's not a story, or you might say that's not much of a story, that it has, it has potential as a story, but it's not much of a story. And narratologists talk about that. And they, they've, they use the, the concept of narrativity, that a, a text can have greater or less, more or less narrativity. And I, and that, that, I, that, that, speaks to me in a lot of ways. Um, so I just want to put that out there. We know um, narratives as orienting to time. We have we have tropes for that, like once upon a time or, um, you know, words that sort of, you know, signal that time is passing. Now, your favorite movie or novel might do funky things with time. And I can think of a few. Um, but nonetheless, the conventional understanding, you know, in a way, those those experimental forms sort of underscore the point, which is that the conventionalized story has something about time passing. And finally, a story we generally take to have a point, and, and it's an it's a moral point, and there's a lot of discussion around this. Um, but if my story of waking up and this and that happened doesn't have a point, you might say also it's not much of a story. You would recognize it as a story, arguably, but it has no point. There needs to be, and this reaches, uh, it brings us to sociology and social life. There needs, to, it seems, there needs to be a reason for telling a story. And oh, that's really rich. Actually, that's really productive because we, um, we are often, or we are always tailoring our story to the reason for telling it for the, for the context. And then furthermore, for the interlocutor. So there's a lot of inspiration um, for the ideas behind narrative criminology. There is a narrative psychology, which is older than narrative criminology. People date it to the late 70s. Um, and big, big idea. Identity itself is storied. We know ourselves as characters in a running story. This is Mark Freeman, American psychologist, who writes that narrative is the basic medium in which human beings speak, think, grow into selves, and understand others. I just picked some choice quotes. There are uh, the, the most famous figure in narrative um, psychology, there are a few, but is a person named Jerome Bruner. Um, and then um, a bigger point, actually, it's, it's more foundational. We know everything via stories, not just the self. We know the whole world through stories. Margaret Summers is a sociologist at the University of Michigan, and she writes in a, in a very good paper, it is through narrativity that we come to know, understand, and make sense of the social world. So a narrative criminology is is in a sense, I mean, it strikes me and 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 some of my colleagues as sort of just an extension of these ideas that if if you know the world through narratives, then you the narratives are um, instrumental to what you do. So I'll get back to that. 
I didn't see if Sandra was in the room and I, um, but not for, not in anticipation of her being here did I did I cite her rather she and her colleagues wrote a really fabulous oops what did I do wrote a really fabulous paper I just pulled out some of my favorites that do particular work among the recent papers um, framed by narrative criminology Anne Barrera is a is um, a criminologist in the Philippines. And he wrote a really wonderful um, paper that um, describes the uh, Philippine President Duterte in terms of um, and his his very vicious drug war policy in terms of stories. Avi Brisman is doing great stuff connecting green criminology with narrative criminology. Um, Hamilton and Sanchez, I was interested to provide an example of, of, um, of a line of work where uh, narrative criminology is kind of being taken in, in sort of a questionnaire, big data analysis, statistical analysis direction with um, a questionnaire, uh, an instrument that picks out narrative roles. It's mostly situated in the UK. Um, and so then, as I mentioned, Sandra joined, um, many of us know Paul Juicy and, and uh, Sarah Thompson, who, um, whose, whose study here is an example of where narratives are, are um, counters to harm, are, are meant to resist uh, recruitment to terrorist activity. And then finally, Svein and Sandberg with Heath Copes and um, uh, their Danish colleague, Willie Peterson, um, um, did this nice, um, nice piece that takes that, that, that is good for people who are saying, well, isn't this just neutralization theory and so forth when pe peaceful people fight. Okay. So now I'm moving on to the second of my main questions, which is like, what are the mechanisms? How, how do stories affect harm? And you may already have anticipated um, one or more of these. The first one is actually a little bit less intuitive to me than the others, um, but it's out there in the literature. We act for the sake of a particular story. Really interesting stuff. Stories frame things, which I feel like was very much um, uh, in this presentation already. And then stories stir us or, or um, are emotionally sort of get us going in some way. And actually, when I developed this talk, it was number three that I really wanted to talk to you about because I wrote a book about it, Inside Story. So what's with this we act for the sake of our stories? A very nice study was done by a person named Curtis Jackson Jacobs, who um, studied under Jack Katz, um, who's a, a very well-known cultural criminologist. He went to Tucson, Arizona. He hung out with young guys who were middle-class guys, and they looked forward to a weekend of picking fights with people and having fights like including with each other. And his question was like, why are, why are they having these fights? Um, so he writes, fighters intend their brawls to make good stories that reveal themselves as charismatic. And so they enact storylines that they expect will both test their character and be applauded by audiences. So they're, they're fighting for the sake of the story in, in my view. And this cartoon from the New Yorker some time back um shows it, it gets it makes the same point two kids in a school cafeteria holding trays of food and they have backpacks on their backs and they uh one says to the other if we become friends now in 20 years we can say we've been friends for that long so the the current action is um intended for future storytelling more generally, and I think a little bit more accessible, and um, yeah, is is the is the idea that stories frame things, and and with Margaret Summers' um, quote, you know, that the stories are just the lens through which we see the world. 
Francesca Paletta is a cultural sociologist in California. I forget where she is right now because she moved. Um, and a very, very excellent, um, I guess she's also called a political sociologist because she does a lot of social movement stuff. But she is very interested in narrative and writes, familiar stories make some courses of action seem reasonable, fitting, even possible, missing a comma, and others seem ineffectual, ill-considered, or impossible. Philip Smith, again, talks about how events are seen through genres. And what happens, and this is, you know, sort of an old interactionist, symbolic interactionist observation, that what happens only has meaning through meaning-making activities, which are discursive and um, in the hands of, um, of the, the narrative turn, or as a result of the narrative turn, are narrative in nature. So I wrote a book. Um, I think it's 2018 um, inside story to, to sort of push push as much as I could the idea that there's a third mechanism that stories get us going emotionally. They make us feel some kind of way. And I didn't make it up, although I was, it was it's already out there a little bit in criminology. Like if anyone's read the crowd is that Gustave Le Bon, but you know, there's there's something in some work about like you know, like the the collective sort of hysteria or you know something, and then there's there's a little bit around the stories that get told, but mostly my inspiration was stuff from the humanities and also a psychology of reading. So I call this, this is just what I research on narrative consumption or narrative uptake. Lots of uh, metaphor. We get lost in stories. We are seduced by stories. And I, I, it resonated with me because the one novel that I get to read per year, I get lost in it. I don't hear background noise. Um, I'm 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 feeling annoyed at the protagonist. I'm feeling happy for the protagonist because something ha good happened to her. And so I I got it. I was like, yeah, we do. That happens. What is that? And by the way, the this body of work comes also from cinema scholars um, who are so inclined to to think about reception and so forth. Reading can put us into a sort of trance, and then a critical angle that when we are immersed in stories we are our our critical capacities our our capacities for weighing evidence and so forth is sort of out the window and um this this um last point makes that uh, uh, says the same thing again a metaphor we're swept away by a story and thus come to believe in ideas suggested by the narrative in the in the time of um, of Trump and um, and times before, um, you know, it, it, it one sort of can appreciate this without doing any deep dive into data. Just like, yeah, there's something that people get carried away by, and they're not even um, thinking very deeply, or they stop thinking deeply. So. I wanted to dig in a bit more, and so I started reading a, um, a massive body of work on what is the nature of emotion or, you know, psychology of emotion. And there are very many theories of what emotion is, uh, but I was taken with what I what I see was, a, what I saw was a prominent theory, which is that, and I'm listing some anchors for emotion, that emotion is tied up with our goals for ourselves, our plans. Emotion is keyed to, to change. So I suddenly feel very angry because suddenly there's a noise or suddenly somebody canceled something on me. Um, emotions are tied to how we construct ourselves and especially how the identities that we aspire to have. You're tied up with our sense of agency and um, 
number five is like a different thing, which is that we feel in ways that are sort of already laid out for us because the evaluations or appraisals on which the feeling is based is already out there in the culture. Um, Martha Nussbaum, famous philosopher, and um, I'm forgetting um, Lazarus's first name, um, but they help me with four and five. So Nussbaum talks about how the most dramatic emotional charge comes from, quote, the especially complicated thoughts that humans are likely to form about their own need for objects and about their imperfect control over them. And Lazarus um, making that point about preformed evaluations and hence the enculturation or collectivization of emotion. Many appraisal decisions have already been all but made and need only the appropriate environmental cue to trigger them. So the example I had in my head earlier today was like learning that I just got a grant. And without even thinking very much um, about well, what this means for my career, nonetheless, it's already out there in my small culture of academia that this is a good thing, that this is great for my career, that this says speaks well of me. Um, and I know it to, you know, or I, I consider it, I, I position it as, as furthering my goals and so forth. Well, turn to narrative and one sees that narrative and emotion are closely related. Narratives depict plans and goals or are about plans and goals. Narratives thematize change. Changes, um, change of events is sort of central to conventional narrative. Narratives center on agency. There's a protagonist who does things. A story without anyone doing anything is kind of a boring story, not much of a story. Narratives construct selves or identities. And narratives deploy culturally familiar evaluations. There's a whole lot of miniaturized conventional understandings in stories. So what I do in Inside Stories, I set all that out, but then I say, well, but nonetheless, the um, affect, affective potential of stories is a variable. So what's up with that? Well, I dug in and... Um, and did uh, a lot of analysis and came up with um, another list of characteristics that stories with the most emotional that are that 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 um, prompt us to um, to greater absorption and emotionality have stark differences, feature conflict, reversals, negativity is always good. Power is threatened and then restored, but that's a particular kind of reversal that is um, really goes to the heart of what humans um, pay attention to. An invitation to immortality um, is um, tends to to get us going. And interestingly, and this kind of leads into more recent work, we get a charge from texts that are somewhat subtle that leave some things out that leave us in suspense. Um, if you if you think about your own um, writing and maybe if you do any, I have a colleague who does poetry. You know, th there's the the sort of ch choosy leaving of gaps is tends to sort of pull at us. And there's there's a lot of work on this in literary studies um, about. Um, and, and aesthetics, which is a branch of philosophy about the power of gaps, which I won't have time to get into. But So here's an example. Um, the context for this is migrants coming in from the South to the United States. And there was a moment in November of 2018 when... Um, Agents at the border um, started spraying tear gas and were, were generally very violent towards the, the migrants. And this is sort of a famous picture, picture that was going around. Oops, sorry. 
Um, and this is a conservative blogger who's um, legitimizing the, the violence and so forth. Um, so when frustrated migrants, perhaps emboldened by irresponsible rhetoric from the American left, simply try to force their way in, how ought our country respond? It seems fairly obvious that the correct response is the one they met, a forceful one. The right response ensures that our border is secure and cannot be infil infiltrated by anyone who decides to storm in, throw rocks, and run into America. I just looked at my watch, and I think I should pick up the pace. Um, very rudimentary, not even an analysis, but the start of just like, okay, well, one way I can broach this is, you know, who who's who are the characters, or more specifically, who are the bad guys? Um, what are what are their actions, or what are people's actions, and how are what what other um, um, characterizations are in play? Um, and um, I'm gonna. I can circle back to anything, but including this um, example. When I say that um, an invitation, when I use that expression, well, I, I don't know if it's Ernest Becker's expression, but um, a very good book, Denial of Death um, by Becker in 73, talks about um, the pull of, uh, he doesn't talk about stories, but he talks about how much we seek out moments of immortality or opportunities to construct immortality for ourselves. And, um, and then one can think about um, stories that suggest transcendence um, tend to tend to be arousing stories, um, some for all time sorts of um, sorts of themes. Okay, so I have some, um, I hope you'll forgive me for skipping over this, and um, the attention that I pay to what I call the figurative pull um, um, owes a lot to filling in those gaps for ourselves with our own circumstances, our own bank of memories, our own concerns. Um, that is sort of, that is the thinking or that's that's one sort of one often sees that why is it that you know that gaps are alluring to us because we we sort of put ourselves in the frame. Um, well, if as as one thinks about gaps in stories, um, you can think about suspense. You can think about um, you know certain characters are are underdrawn or little is said about them in certain characters. We learn a lot about them, and there's a lot of ways to think about this. But in sociology, um, we have and criminology uh, with Spinan's work, we have some frameworks. Um, Bamberg and Georgia Coppola are um, actually in um, Georgia Coppola is in the UK and Bamberg is in the United States, but um, have set up this small stories framework. And they say that most of the stories that we traffic in are small stories. They're sort of like starts of stories or like, I have a story. Let me just get to cut to the chase. It wasn't good, you know, and, um, and are, are sort of messy in this way. And so part of their, project is getting people to, to study that more in um, socio-narratology. Um, one of the things that I find most interesting are how sto small stories can, um, can because I don't have to spell it out or because I feel like I don't need to spell it out, I'm sort of trusting that you and I both know that story. So perhaps at, at a moment um, in this present war, Ukraine or its leaders said, you know, David and Goliath or, you know, or channeled that sort of story without even spelling it out, without even using those words, but sort of everybody knows that story. And it's a story that can that can spur activity, that can legitimize and that can can create hope. Um, and um, if if they would spell it out, it might sort of I don't know, sort of ruin the point. Um, but anyway, so stories can 
can really connect us to a larger cultural um, frame. And Sveinin, um, for some reason, decided to use his own vocabulary and calls, uh, he refers to tropes as words or phrases that hint towards a familiar story. Ah, I think a great example of a trope is MAGA, Make America Great Again. Um, it's four words. You could call it a slogan, but it actually has some narrativity to it. Um, and and actually some pretty weighty narrativity. Um, it, it suggests, it implies that America is not great. It was great. So it's got that temporal feeling. And oh, the familiar story to the insiders to it are that, well, brown and black people, you know, rose in in power in our society. And that really brought us down. And so let's get America great again. And that's kind of like the whatever, what everybody knows. Uh, I could talk more about MAGA. So my conclusions, unfortunately, I have a lot of them. Here's my conclusions regarding the paradigm, narrative criminology. Narrative criminology is a paradigm according to which stories influence harm. Criminology has appreciated stories, um, okay, typo, for what they tell us about criminogenic factors. The focus of narrative criminology, in contrast, is not what the stories are about, but how they're told. And then I, I identified three mechanisms. Regarding narrative and arousal, the third mechanism, um, I found that narrative is a highly affecting cultural form, which is variable. Emotions stem from our evaluations of how we're doing vis-a-vis -vis goals and identity. And narratives constructs, in fact, construct such evaluations. They're very good at that. Narratives that emphasize uncertain outcomes that are consequential to identity and agency are the most absorbing. We're especially aroused by stories that promise unending significance. That's all I have. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'll just quickly say, as uh, Sandra, as you know, has three kids, and one of them is a very good hockey player. So she, her husband's out of town. She's had to grab all three kids and take one of them out of town to a hockey tournament. So <laughs> that's why she's not here. But I'm sure she appreciates the the reference. So uh, I have uh, people have said thank you, uh, but I will start with a question. Who is this from? It's from Isabel. So I will read it directly. Uh, you, you mentioned near the beginning of your talk how Agnew believes that criminalized people present a selective and often distorted portrayal of events and conditions leading up to a crime, harm. Colonial institutions and actors have also, also have incentives to manipulate narratives and official documents and policies in order to make themselves look good. For example, less colonial, more progressive. Indigenous peoples' accounts of their experiences of criminalization have continually been silenced, yet, yet are vital to include and integrate into the field of narrative criminology, as they often resent counter narratives to dominant colonial uh, narratives. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, thank you very much, Isabel. I love this uh, question. And um, so, at the start of it, so you're recognizing, like appreciating, in fact, that Agnew's point that, that may be tweaked to to say that that people that elites, including you know settlers, have had um, have incentives to distort, um, especially official narratives, and I think that's a really um, really good redirection and reminds me of where criminology should be more than on, you know, the distortion proclivities of, you know, of young kids who, who get into our system. Um, and I couldn't agree more on the need um, for the, for attention to the counter narratives of the colonized. Um, and um, in my book on said, there's a chapter on um, how to restore or how to recognize what's been left out. And it's um, it, it can be difficult, but in, in so many cases uh, with official histories, it's, it's fairly low hanging fruit to, to, to grasp that um, it's, you know, these are the histories that are, um, that have been uh, laid down by, by elites um, with very strong incentives, um, material incentives, um, and ideological ones. 
Um, I'm appreciating the the question, and I think that the work on counter narratives um, could. Um, I mean, I don't care very very much if it's framed or not by a narrative criminology, but I see how it it could very well be. Thank you. Um, just invite anyone to have any questions, but I will. Um, I'll ask one. Uh, it was <laughs> I had two questions, and I was curious that both of them kind of related to your, your positivist gesture. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree completely that narratives have consequences; they have effects, and you list all kinds of them. But all of the things that you pointed to are multi-causal, and they're overdetermined by all kinds of things that aren't just narratives. I'm just curious how to think about multi-causality in relationship to narratives. So what, how do we know that a narrative is consequential? How do we know that it's more consequential than other factors? Are there particularly consequential narratives on particular issues? So I just, it's that kind of positive. It does things in a context where there may be a thousand factors shaping that thing. Yeah, there's a few ways to answer this question. And in preparation for this talk, I reread um, an article that um, Shad Maruna um, co-authored with a, um, a Dutch criminologist, Marieke Liam, uh, 2021. And it's like a critique of narrative criminology. And so this is like, a, you know, sort of the message, like, how how do you know? Um, and what's the rigorous research? Um, so, okay, so to to sort of broach it, I mean, if you if you pick this lens up, you think that all of those other factors work with narrative. So you appreciate the the multi determination. So um, so in other words. Um, um, to get trying to think of a good example. So, um, you know, I'm poor and um, I get involved in some some vice, some drug trafficking, let's say, in order to to survive. Um, but if but this the the culture provides me not just with opportunities in the way of drug trafficking and role models as per mid century you know subcultural theorists but also a story that is acceptable in either subculture or mainstream culture or both as to you know this is what one does and this is has its own legitimacy as work um, and so I I feel like one can't now i agree that it could be more rigorously assessed um you know in these variety of contexts how narrative worked in conjunction with my very real objective poverty um but i i can't think out of that lens like i can't not think that a narrative is shaping um is is one of the is as at play and is working in conjunction with objective conditions right well i it, they don't even have to be you know quote unquote objective conditions right. so they, could be other, they could be other narratives that are operative so right. the, the mix of factors that are shaping things i guess as i'm trying to i'm trying to flag so but anyway yeah yeah know. that's good um so this is a next question is from L'Oreal. Thanks, L'Oreal. Uh, great talk, Dr. Presser. Uh, you mentioned that some stories have a greater emotional charge than others or are more affecting than others. Some of the distinctions you, you discussed seem to be from the point of view of the storyteller rather than the reader. Can you speak more about the interplay between storyteller and reader, especially as it pertains to emotional affect, especially considering the once a narrative is out there the way in which it is perceived may be out of the control of the storyteller. Yeah, that's that's really, really, really smart. So I have to stare at this a little bit. Um, some of the distinctions you discussed, like, oh, the, the um, let me think what that might be. And I don't know if um, this person wants to speak, but uh, seem to be from the point of view of the storyteller. So let me let me try to get my thing going here. 
Um, hey, Kevin, because you're the person I can see, would you help me out? Do you think um, maybe this is this is what we should have? Up? Um, so it's like the the storyteller. So in the white nationalist context, the storyteller is saying, you know, we we white men or whoever are are down and it's it's the fault of immigrants or whoever and so it's the question that um like how like how is it is that the same story that the that the audience l'oreal do you want to chime in I, I see you're virtually here she may have stepped away um I, I do think there is something really, really interesting. And I, I think of a lot of people in discourse analysis circles who are like, we're, we should be, we ought to be studying reception um, and not just like what gets put out there, but how it, how it strikes people. So I'm, you know, appreciating um, the question. I think I kind of, in, and using my own example, broad example of white nationalism, which is the story that, you know, or, the, or their story is very much on my mind. Um, um, I, I, I feel like I've gotten, I and others, but I've gotten uh, at that empirically a little bit sideways by um, a, a study I did and I, I did and I published in 2012 was on a domestic terrorist um, and and it was uh, from 2012. His name was David Atkinson and he went into a church in Tennessee and shot a bunch of people, killed two people, injured six others, and so he, there was this sort of he would, he, and I went to interview him in prison and he would channel sort of an official story or not an official story, a, a story that he heard on the radio of how white people are on the run and um, not just immigrants, but also African-Americans and gay people. And, Jew, you know, it was like a potpourri of people who, you know, sort of took things away. And, and then I would, I would also ask him like, well, what is your story? What is your, you know, is that, is that your story? And he would tweak it and it would have, it, it, it sort of, he didn't have too much, you know, that went along with, you know, that, you know, that person of color took my job, you know, his, his, his own personal story was actually a little bit different, but that was actually quite interesting to me. Like he still felt like power was threatened and he hoped to restore it through violence, but the, the particulars fell away and it was more like I got depressed. So I lost my job and da, da, da. Um, I don't know. It it it's but I guess it, like I've I've studied the the you know like what's the story on the ground and what's this bigger story being told and I think that is um really would be fertile to sort of pay more dedicated attention to that. Great. Thank you. I I have a question here that came in on YouTube so I'll just read it because I don't think you have access to it. Uh so from YouTube I'm not sure who it was. It says uh, the importance of narratives informing people's major perceptions about social issues has become increasingly apparent with online information sharing. From your perspective, is there something different about society today that has allowed for smaller, extreme, perspec extreme perspective groups to have seemingly greater pull than in the past, or does it just feel that way? Oh, that's a brilliant question. Um, and I'm also going to punt that only because um, I know that people are studying that, especially in digital humanities. And I don't read in that area. It's like I, I see these, you know, call for papers and variety of, of things. Um, I mean, except in the sense that I think that there's a whole lot of more like um, um, participatory storytelling, but I think you're getting at something more vexing, which is that the most extreme voices are, are storytellers, like maybe, you know, somehow, it, like, those people got elected <laughs> to be the cultural uh, um, narrators, and I, I that's, a, you're making me wonder about that, but I, I don't really know. <laughs> 
Thank you. I think we might be out of questions unless there's someone wants to chime in or if somebody on Zoom wants to reveal themselves and ask a question. I do see a question in the chat. Does oh, that, maybe I missed does that count? Oh, oh, yeah, there is. Celine asked one. So thank you for presentation, Dr. Presser. Is there a way where narrative criminology could apply to stories that may not influence harm? Is harm always construed as negative through a narrative criminological lens? Well, it, that's just me who defines harm as negative. Um, I Some students will come along and say, well, if if you know there's certain self-harm that's positive like suicide in certain contexts or um i haven't um dedicated too much time to that i i think that cultural criminology has done a good job of sort of restoring fun and transgressive stuff for criminology and i think that cultural criminology at large could use, you know, more attention to narrative. So maybe that would be the avenue to take. But I think if, if the, if for me, the, if the dependent variables harm, I'm sort of locked into it, you know, being a downer about things. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we're at time. Uh, thank you very much. Virtual sort of applause and thank yous. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a, Dr. Presser has a long list of works in this area. Um, I think what was you know interesting about this talk was the the framing, but I think that probably predictable of the genre. What's really interesting is the empirical kind of case study. So I'd encourage people to go and dig into it because I think that's where the flesh goes on the bones of this and for people who are really interested in it, I think that's where it really appears. So um, just as a last note, um, our next speaker will be Professor Steve Kent, who I am informed is speaking on something related to religion, crime, but apparently um, I don't know exactly what he's talking about. I haven't been perfectly informed, but many of us know Steve, so that'll be interesting. And thanks, Lois, and we'll be in touch next week. We have some things to do. So. <laughs> okay, thanks, everybody. Really, really enjoyed it. Take care. Yep.